All right, ladies and gentlemen, I am recording now. We finally got uh, Dave Banks on here. We had a little bit of a technical glitch and I had to coach him through it. And I was sharing some three principles stuff. I don't know if he's familiar with the three principles, but we got him to relax. He's really good. I'm, <laughs> I'm relaxed as well. And uh, Dave, it's so good to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for the invitation, Amir. I'm, I'm sorry. About, I'm, I'm actually on the road today. So um, I'm sorry about this technical problem, um, but uh, hello to everyone. And um, yeah, I've been looking forward to this. This is I've been looking forward to this for a while. So um, go at it. What do you? Yeah, want to let's let's go at about? it. All right. So hmm. first of all, uh, while you were while we we're trying to figure this out, I was looking at all the people that joined. Um, I just want to say, if if I put us in gallery view. We have, and some people are coming back in about a half an hour because they thought it's going to be in about a half an hour. So we're probably going to have more. Okay. We had three full panels of people just to come and hear this out. So I'm excited as much as everybody else. Um, before we begin, uh, Dave, okay, great. tell us a little bit about you. <laughs> well, an easy, an easy question, right? Uh, <laughs> well, well, um, everybody or most people, I think, know that I'm Sid's son, and um, um, I've been since my father passed away in in uh, 2009. Um, I've been up until that point. I mean, I did a, I did attend many of his public talks and so on, but up until that time, I wasn't very involved in the community per se. But after he passed away. I really felt a strong sense of um, obligation in this way, almost that uh, to, to to give back. Um, it was a very humbling experience for me when he passed away because I realized just just how much he had given me and given the world, and I felt a real sense of obligation to pay pay it forward. And so, you know, I've become more and more involved with the three principles community and um i i'm really i'd really like to see it continue and go forward because it's it's you know been so impactful on so many people around the world and i i get messages from people all the time really powerful heartfelt messages about how his teachings have transformed their life or um, and they're just so grateful. And that's very moving to me. So that's where we are at the moment, Amir. Yes. All right. And with that being said, I, I know you said you're getting involved with the three principles more recently. I know you've, you've been immersed in it just because of your father. But, mm -hmm. you know, many of you guys don't know, me and Dave will jump on a call and just start riffing about things and he's actually uh, you have a very deep understanding of the three principles and I was actually I wasn't surprised but I was surprised how much you knew considering we don't you're not a coach you're not a therapist you're not a a three principles practitioner right and so I want to know from your point of view number one why aren't you involved in a lot of the, the community? How come we don't see you in some of the groups and things like that? What's, what's, where do you, where do you hide and, and where have you been? <laughs> well, it, it, it's been partly a pragmatic issue, uh, Amir. There, there's, a, there's, there's a certain time constraint, but, but also, I mean, there's literally so much happening around the world. It's very difficult for me to even keep up with it, to be honest. And um, uh, so I, I have to be somewhat selective in terms of what I what I join and what I don't join. Um, and um, you know it's growing and growing all the time. But um, and I'm also actually a very private person, so I, I I'm not really interested in tooting my horn in any way. And uh, but I I do I am deeply moved by how his teachings have you know, expanded around the world since his passing and um, which he predicted by the way he, he, 
he told me before he passed away that this would happen. And, um, and, and I feel also a deep obligation to make sure, do what I can to maintain the purity of his teachings, because that was extremely important to him. Um, and he was probably more concerned about that than anything before he passed away was, was that the, the, the purity be maintained. You know, we talked about that on our call about the purity and we, we were discussing what that even means when you say the period of the principles, I guess this is a twofold question that I had mm -hmm. in my mind is number one, do you feel, and I know this is going to get tricky, but in your opinion, do you feel like the purity of the principles is being properly passed down? Number one, if that's a yes or no, number two, if it's not, why that would be in your, in, in your point of view? from what you've seen? Well, first of all, first of all, uh, Amir, and any of the original students will know this, is that it's, it was all, maintaining the purity was kind of a, always an issue for my father, even when he was, was present with us. He was constantly battling um, circumstances where it had been misinterpreted or, or misused or misunderstood. And, um, you know, he spent actually a good amount of his time. I mean, I don't have a number, but it was a good amount of his time um, trying to resolve um, problems like that. So that he and, and, and I don't think that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's perfectly understandable why the purity would be would be undermined at times because people's levels of con it all has to do with people's levels of consciousness and if they're on that lower level of consciousness they're not going to understand the teachings in the way he intended them and they may even be well intentioned in the way in which they try to um you know share the teachings with others um and and still compromise the teachings so I, I, it's not like i'm trying to point fingers or or um vilify anyone but because everybody does the best they can with what they have by and large so but it's it's just an, an it's a natural kind of uh result that's going to happen but when, when you get you know tens of thousands of people and everybody's on a different level of consciousness and my father's not not around anymore to kind of police this if you want to use that term um so it's it becomes a bigger bigger problem a bigger risk i guess is that that when these teachings are misinterpreted or, or misapplied um there's there's no one there to kind of bring bring things back to equilibrium you know so i mean it's 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 going to continue to be an issue and uh um it's it's kind of just a natural evolution of things, but but it, by going back to that's why it's so important. I feel that people go back to his original writings because there that's where the purity lies, and you can't do better than his own words. So his own his his audio works his 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 writings. Uh, that's to me that's where it's at. Are you uh, talking about? before he talked about the three P's when he was a little bit more esoteric, or are you just talking about in general and any of his stuff? Yeah, in general, any of his stuff, but there obviously was a, there was a transition point there and people who have, um, you know, reviewed a lot of his materials will, will probably notice that there wasn't even the use of language and terminology changed at some point in the very late seventies, early eighties. And there was a transition uh, uh, more to a professional psych, 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 psychology approach. Just um, and um, uh, some prefer the earlier material. I, I understand that it is a little bit more esoteric. Um, I personally really, really like the early material as well. But, um, you know, it's it was there was a reason why it changed and it changed because the application changed. So um, for example, he used the term Christ consciousness a lot in the early years 
uh, and that was unpalatable to a lot of workplaces and to a lot of psychologists who were working in institutions. They couldn't use that term, so they had to use a different term. But it doesn't still doesn't undermine the teaching. So Does that makes sense. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And if there's anyone that mm -hmm. wants to put questions in the chat while we're discussing anything, I'd love to hear. Um, uh, actually, we have one from Anita. She said, "Well intentioned, yes, but if one does not understand, how do they pass it pass on in purity?" So, so in other words, so let's say they're not they're not uh, they are well intentioned, and we all are. Obviously, all of us are well intentioned, and we're doing the best mm -hmm. we can, sharing the principles. What what would be the litmus test of 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 going towards purity? Like, what what would what would you, in your opinion, would be the uh, the direction to look into? Well, it's it's a very difficult thing to ascertain in a way because it, you have to be you have to be on the right level of consciousness to understand the purity, Amir. So, um, and until the person's level of consciousness changes, they won't, it's very difficult for them to under, to to understand that. Um, but you know, my father, when he was around, he would simply say, "No, that's 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 not what I intended. That's that's wrong," and and that would sort of be the end of it usually. Um, but it's you know, it's all it's all inside at the end of the day, and the and the and the the individual every individual has to um, come to their own personal understanding of it, and. So it's not like a, a, you know a sort of a checklist you can make and this is pure that's not it's a much deeper understanding of of what, the the kind of spiritual intention of his words. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, when my wife tells me something, and then. An hour later, someone says the exact same thing. And I go, oh, you should have heard what, what my friend just told me. And they're like, I said that to you an hour ago. <laughs> and it is. It's a level of consciousness thing. At the time when my wife may have said something, I just wasn't in that headspace to actually yeah. hear it. Same thing at my recovery center. Is that along the lines of what you're saying? Is there is this this opening that you might, that you have to have, the sense of uh, a, a deepening before? Because I've, I've, I've read Sid different times, and I've I've literally – ready different book every single time i've read his stuff right and right is that what you're pointing to that's exactly what i'm saying so um every time you his his material never gets old every time you read it you're you're reading it from a slightly different pr perspective um different state of mind and you will read it slightly differently and uh, when he was around amir he was and I mean, those those on the call who had the great privilege of meeting him will know that he had he created this almost what I would like a sacred space around himself. And just being in his presence was uplifting in and of itself. So, I mean, he could raise someone's level of consciousness just in his just by his presence um, or, at, you know, when he would give a public talk there would be, you could hear a pin drop. There was silence, absolute silence in the room. Um, and after the talk had finished, um, the level of consciousness in the room was palpably higher. So, and he spoke in a stream of consciousness. He would, when he sat down in the chair, he literally didn't know what he was going to say. And if you asked him afterwards what he said, he couldn't remember it. Because he was he was speaking not from the intellect. He was speaking from um, a much a, a much more powerful intelligence. So, yeah, it's um, everybody has their own journey, Amir, and um, no, not there's no no two of us that have the same spiritual journey. Every single one is unique, and all you can do really is you know, um, spend as much time as you can with his teachings and with other 
individuals on who have learned a lot from his teachings and you know hopefully you know you evolve you know your level of awareness increases but it's it's there's no way to predict it actually you know any people can have an insight at any time and you, and you usually don't see it coming it comes out of the out of nowhere so yeah just uh you know read read his material stay uh i'm I'm not suggesting you shouldn't read anything else i'm not you know i'm not anti-intellectual in that sense but um there are there is a lot of wonderful writings out there but um it it's a bit of a minefield and you can easily get lost and you can easily get off track so you have to be really careful about that that's why i say keep coming back to his the purity of his teachings and it it will not lead you astray so if i heard you correctly you said read all of his books and amir karkuti's book i just wanted to clarify i, I don't want to put words in your mouth but... <laughs> no definitely <laughs> just, no you know that you, one. Yeah. you know you, you you did mention um that there was a level of consciousness that would shift when you're in the room, uh, when, when, uh, when he would do yes. his talks, and I'm sure you were in the room at the mm -hmm. time. There was something you said mm -hmm. on our calls when we spoke that he didn't just start the groups with, hi, this is a three principles thing. You would say he would, what quote unquote, you would say he would break bread and there was music. Can you share a little bit about, I want to kind of be in the room of, of what it was like to be in a room with Sid and what it was like to have an event because he he encapsulated an event not just by his talks but he it, it was a it was a the whole thing mattered to him is that correct can you kind of explain what you said to with me on the call mm. well particularly in the early days there was he called them gatherings and there were uh, many of them and where they would get together and he would speak and there would normally sometimes be be, be music afterwards and there would be a, a, usually a shared communal meal a potluck meal or something like that and he what he understood was that um change just just changing the the level of consciousness collectively in the room in and of itself was uplifting to people so he put, for example, a great importance on the venues. He never chose a bad venue, none that I ever saw, at least. He just had a, he had an incredible talent for picking beautiful venues his, for his public talks. And he did that on purpose. He did that because he knew um, that um, the surroundings were very important in terms of, you know, you don't want a noisy, chaotic, surrounding so the surroundings were very important in terms of setting the stage or setting the the um, um the tranquility of the of the of the talk so um yeah so he, often his his gatherings were in you know the real green space or they were beautiful settings like mills college and California or Seabeck in Washington State, which is right on the river, a beautiful place. So he, you know, he, he really had a, a sixth sense for creating a beautiful environment. And again, creating that sacred, developing that sacred space. And people would naturally elevate when they got into that sacred space. Was there ever music in any of his events? Did he do anything with that? Or was it just he went straight to his talks? Well, in the early days, there were there were musicians, uh, you know, uh, not professional musicians, but just um, students, if you will, who who had, you know, who enjoyed music and they would they, they would play it off. But often they were sort of like gospel slash folk music. But, you know, you know, it was just just about getting together and, and having fun together. 
And uh, he didn't like, he liked everything, every, uh, very, keep everything very light. He didn't like a heavy atmosphere at all. So he, he would, he just was a genius at creating that beautiful atmosphere that people would thrive in. I, uh, are you okay if we get a, any questions at this time? I'm curious if there's anyone sure, else. Sure. And then we'll get back to, I have a couple more thoughts that I want to discuss. Is there anybody that wants to raise their hand and ask Dave anything? Let's see how that works. We have, oh, of course, Dominic has a question. Let's see what Mr. Dominic Scafidi has to say. Hey, uh, Dave, uh, great to be talking to you. Uh, thanks for taking yeah, the time hi, to do Dominic. Yeah, um, uh, I love what you said about um, uh, your dad's early expression of, of his insights and his teaching. Um, and then later he said, as the, the words changed, um, and in you know in a more professional way or uh, what whatever, whatever right. you want to say, and I and I can relate to that because I I have a, a challenge in when I'm working in organizations of the same thing is how do I speak about this stuff so that I that they you know they don't hear it like it's something weird or strange or like that so I I can appreciate why he did that I guess the part I wanted to just um, I, I think I know the answer, but his early expression and the, the way that he spoke about it then is mm -hmm. just as true as his later expression. So in other words, there wasn't, you know, oh, you know, I, he changed it or went to a different, you know, teaching. I guess that that, that was my question in in your mind it's the same thing expressed differently i think so dominique and and we have to remember that that language he would say over and over don't listen to my words you know um look for a feeling so the language in some sense is always imperfect because it's it what he was teaching was not easily conveyed with language and so when i say he created the sacred space around him he would create a that a, a feeling where people would naturally gravitate to um to a certain understanding and so words are they're really inadequate in the first place, but all you can do, and that's why every time you read his work, you get a different message. You're reading the same words, but the message is differently, or you might see it something in a, at a deeper level. So you have to look, look beyond the words. And he would, you know, joke that, you know, people would come to hear him talk and you'd say, you know, I know you're here to hear me talk, but I'm telling you, don't listen to my words. <laughs> it just seems it's slightly amusing to a lot of people. But there was a powerful teaching in what he was saying there. He was saying it's a spiritual understanding. So don't get too hung up on the the words or the language. You know? mm. In 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 your uh, maybe this is a bit of a follow up question, but um, so you obviously could really feel what he was pointing to there was to to the extent that you could i mean and and uh i i understand what you mean because in reading his books or in listening to him talk i have had that experience of hearing new words new things that that get said so it's the it's it's coming from somewhere else but you so you have that um um, sense of the feeling of what he was pointing to. What, what What's your perspective on um, how well it is being expressed today in the community? How how close is it being expressed um, in total? Well, what I, I think, Dominique, that, I mean, that's 
difficult to answer because there's so many different w- people expressing it in so many different ways. And to be fair, with with him not around anymore, um, I mean, it, it does. It is obviously more challenging. But I'm I'm just saying that being in his presence, and I'm sure there are original students who would would attest to this. But just being in his presence was in itself healing. It was very difficult, put it this way, it was very difficult to be around him and not learn something. I mean, you'd have to really be stubbornly um, um, stubbornly intellectual to, to not gain something in being in his presence. I mean, it was that powerful. So, um, I mean, that obviously is a great loss, the fact that he's, not with us anymore but um but his teachings that he left behind are still quite powerful i would say very powerful but they have to be you have to get into the right frame of mind when you're reading them obviously um but yeah it's not it's never going to be the same without him and that's what i came to realize that I had had a tremendous gift um, growing up with him, and I had, you know, had a, fr- you know, a front seat for so many years. Now I didn't. I, be completely honest, I, I, I didn't realize what I had at the time, and I took it very much for granted, which I have a little bit of regret about. But, uh, but I'm, you know deeply grateful um, for for that privilege I was given. Mm. Thank you. And fi- final question. I know there's another hand up. Um, uh, given your sense of his teachings and that, and again, the feeling of it more so than what he was actually mm. teaching, when, um, where else, where else with what other teachers do you get a similar sense who is there in the world today that you hear and you get a sense that they were in very much in harmony with where what Sid was expressing? Well, I don't want to get too much into personalities, but there, there's a lot of people out there who I I hear teaching in a beautiful way, but no one I teaches the way he does. I mean, he had a very unique way of teaching um but you know uh i think Eckhart Tolle is um in many respects especially on the issue of of um of the personal self and ego he's very much in in harmony with what my father was saying but again he's um just a completely different personality and so i i'm really hesitant to draw comparisons you know um but there's no doubt my father uh, was an exceptional exceptional person who had a, an exceptional insight and you know there's very very i would say there's very few people in the world who could who would have a similar sort of level of understanding I, I, w- I would agree. And totally humorous. Yeah. Uh, I hope you didn't pick Eckhart Tolle because he's also resident of Salt Spring Island and lives there. <laughs> no, it's not, there's nothing, there's no favoritism that way. But um, <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> okay. Thank you. The wonderful questions, Dominic, as always. Thanks, buddy. Um, Rasmus, go ahead. And uh, we have. He has a question for you as well. Thanks, Samir. Hi, Dave. My name is Rasmus. I'm from Sweden. Uh Uh-huh. And speaking of words and language and not getting hung up on the specific words, um, a question came to mind while Dominic was speaking. Um, He said something that's, that's quite common. It's when we refer to 
that of which we are speaking right now, we uh, we tend to be at loss for words. So we refer to it as it, like the three principles or this thing. I think you said that, Dominic. I regularly do as well, many others. So words failing us, I think we all know what it is we're talking about, but what would you say, Dave, that it is we are really talking about, if you can even describe it in words? Well, again, I, I even I, I defer all the time to my father's original writings because I don't think any, anyone says it better than he does. But he's trying to describe a universal intelligence that's um, not easily explainable in words. And it's infinitely powerful. And he's, tr he's, tell he's saying to people, look, you've got your personal self, but you've also got this universal intelligence, which is a far, far greater intelligence. And if you can, in, even in a small way, um, grasp this intelligence or allow it, permit it even, to uh, influence your life, you will be transformed in a way which you can't, you probably can't understand at the moment. So, and that, those, those insights, you use the word insights. Insight is just a, a way of that universal intelligence reaching, reaching out to us. Like, and he's saying it's there, it's there all the time. It's just, you can't see it and you, you're just unaware of it, but it's, it's, it's the source of all life, mind, consciousness, and thought. Well, mind is that universal intelligence he's talking about. Consciousness, that's, that's the soul. And the soul is what connects us to that divine consciousness. So it's, you know, when he had his, back in 1973, that, this is the 50th anniversary. I think everybody knows it's the 50th anniversary of this year of his enlightenment, which was in 1973. And um, he actually had two quite powerful insights. The first one, and they were a few days apart. Um, and the first one was the understanding. He had gone to a place called Cold Mountain, which was a kind of retreat. And Alan Watts was one of the people who um, was a counselor at this place. And um, he had an understanding that he, that he had carried throughout his whole life this kind of baggage, this insecure concept of himself. And he called it the poor me as well. The idea that, you know, he had been uh, 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 born out of wedlock and you know he had been adopted as a baby and born into the depression years and then the war years and that he had you know his life basically he had had a um he'd been given some bad cards in life and he held a lot of insecurity and resentment about that and his first insight was that that was just a thought that was carried through time and that it didn't exist anymore. So what, that was a huge up, uplifting insight for him. And um, then a few, several days later, um, he had an even more powerful insight, which, and some people call that the psychological insight, by the way. I was talking to a family member about this just recently. And, um, I, I, I can see how people would interpret it that way. So the idea was that he realized his own thoughts in that first insight, his own thoughts had been, had been um, 
pampering him his whole life and that he just had to the, the thoughts didn't even exist i mean they the, those experiences were had come and gone and he was just holding certain memories that were 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 deeply hampering him so that was kind of a psychological insight and then several days later he had a very powerful what this family member thinks is a more spiritual insight which was the where he said he actually held the hand of god so that was when he understood the power of universal intelligence and um, that was literally sort of a white light experience. So, um, does that does that make sense what I'm saying so far? Um, yes. Am I am well, I answering your your question? Um, my response to that is um, no, but yes. Okay. Well, in what? Tell me. What do you mean, no, but yes? I mean, I mean, it's probably difficult to, to, to answer that question. Like, the thing we're talking about doesn't easily let itself be described in words. That's as close mm -hmm. I can get to it, right? We can, we can talk about, we can, we can say the words, the three principles. And so when I talk to someone who hasn't heard about the three principles, they immediately go up into their heads and ask, okay, so what are those three principles? And we're in, in the intellect. And that's not a good way to describe, to describe them. It's like pointing to a faraway star. You can't see it while staring directly at it and all those metaphors. But I guess what I'm really looking for is the great marketing copy that explains exactly what it is we're talking about. And I, I'm not sure that's mm. possible, but I wanted to ask you if you could, and, and I didn't hear that. I hear sometimes where you're coming from, the feeling behind your words and all that. I'm probably looking for words that, that don't really exist. I think that's right. The, the problem is you can't you can't understand it until you understand it, sort of thing. Like it, it, it's not possible. It's like explaining to a blind person what the color red looks like. Yes. Um, it, until they've yeah, until you've actually had an experience, your level of consciousness has changed. You can't possibly explain that to someone. I mean, you can try to, I, I guess, explain it in words as best you can, but it's, it's, um, it's a feeling. So you can't, um, you can't, you can't give that to another person. I mean, they have to, they have to find it themselves. Yeah. They have to discover it themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Which is a bit tricky. <laughs> yeah. I uh, thank you, Rasmus. This is a great conversation as well. I uh, I I want to I want to circle back now. And go to a little historical uh, direction, if you guys are okay with it. I uh, one question. I want to piggyback this question, and then I want you to give a story that would like that we haven't heard about your father. Number one, I want to put this to rest. So we can figure this out. There's a lot of people on this call. Was your father an uneducated welder? As people say in every single copy that they write in all the books that I see. Uh -huh. um, and and by, by uneducated, are they saying that? I mean, I'm sorry, ninth grade edu education is, I think, specifically what they, what they love to say as if he was uneducated, which supposedly makes the principles more impactful because he's uneducated. I'm curious what your thoughts are around that and how you perceive that, that, that idea about your father being an uneducated ninth grade welder. Well, first of all, Amir, education has absolutely nothing to do with spiritual insight. Uh, in fact, I think my father would probably agree with this is that the 
the intellect actually is more of an enemy than a help. So, um, yeah, because the intellect inherently um, gets in the way of spiritual understanding, because it's all it's the personal mind working, the the personal ego at work. So, it's um, it's in no way helpful. Put it that way. Um, although the combination of intellect and and wisdom is a beautiful combination, it's rare, very rare that you get that. But it it is a beautiful combination. But as far as my father's education, um, it's it's a it's more of a longer, complicated answer because he was, in my opinion, a, quite a Renaissance man, and. Um, the education system in the UK at the time, in Scotland at the time, was 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 very different than our education system. So it's it's hard to um, make a comparison. Grade nine there was not this, quite the same thing as grade nine here, and um, but he didn't. He certainly he didn't go on to university. Um, he didn't have a university degree of any kind, um, but. He was he was a very um, open-minded, learned man. He was you know he was a wonderful painter. He loved to in the early days he loved to paint, um, and he loved to garden. And he was he was he did read quite a bit in the early years. Um, this is a common point of misunderstanding is that. He, after he had his enlightenment experience, he didn't read after that. But before that, he did. And, you know, one could have a conversation about why that is. But I think he, he I mean, once you have an enlightenment experience, um, I don't know <laughs> well, if, if there's a great deal to be learned from reading, you know, spiritual teachings or, you know, but... Um, but anyways, uh, I I think the last the last book he, he read really seriously that had him was um, Ernest Holmes' Science of Mind. But I have a vivid memory of the house being full of books and everything from the Masters of the Far East to Christian Murphy to Don uh, Carlos Castaneda. Etc. And I read all of those books myself, so I know they were in the house. But um, he was uh, he was really um, a very broad-minded person. Let's put it that way. And he had a, a broad uh, number of interests. So that's when I say he. And he was a really a genuine gentleman. So I, I, I would say there was nothing kind of rough or edgy about him whatsoever. So in that sense, uh, I, I viewed him as a bit uh, quite a Renaissance man. That's wonderful. Um, I love that. I, uh, I want to, I wanna, uh, we have a really good question and I want to actually give uh, Michael Fall a thank you because I wouldn't have met you if it wasn't for Michael uh, Fall. He introduced me to you and I wanted to get him on the line because he has a really good question. I think that uh, would be an awesome question. If you're okay. Are you, are you on there, Michael? Yes. No. Okay. Well, don't know if he's on. You there. know what the question is? I do. So I'll answer it. I'll ask it. Okay. 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 He would love to hear what David took away from his exposure to Sid throughout his life. What, um, what was the most significant learnings and how did it impact and shape your life? Well, it's, it's very difficult to point to one particular thing, Amir, because I mean, I spent my entire, you know, childhood and much of my adult with adulthood with him as well, but I would say there are two things that really resonate with me when I think think of my father. And the first is what a just a great father he was. He was so, I mean, 
so doting, so um, generous in every respect. Um, he was just, um, I was really, really blessed to, to have, a, have him as a father. I mean, just purely as, from that point of view as a father. Um, and the second thing is, obviously, um, there are a lot of interesting people around him that came into my life. Um, and, you know, for example, my, my friends at school, they, they thought their life was quite boring in comparison to mine. Because, I mean, my father had people coming from all over the world. And he traveled quite a bit. And I traveled with him often um i went to many of his of his public talks um so i mean his influence on me was obviously very significant but in over a long period of time so i can't really point to one particular say you know i learned this particular thing from him but i I do think that he, he had a tremendous influence on me in terms of both, you know, um, my spiritual outlook on life and also um, what characteristics, those positive characteristics in him as a, as a, um, as a man and a father, I think, also rubbed off on me to some degree. Uh, he and I are had very similar interests. To piggyback off of this question, and this is a, a how did um, discipline happen at your house, or how did fights look like at your house, or when things didn't go well? Like, was he, the, you know, like the why I'm asking this from a coach's perspective? Sometimes people in relationships that are coaches, they think that they can coach their wives or they can coach their kids and probably not the best idea. I'm curious, was, was there any kind of talk about this universal stuff during regular conversation? Was it just what he was infused in him? I'm just curious what a, a regular day looked like in a household if something needed to be discussed. Well, he wasn't, he wasn't preachy or, uh, t uh, you know, he wasn't, he was more of a dad than than the than my teacher in that sense, in a formal sense. So he wasn't like he was trying to teach me. But there were there were obviously times when he um, he would be upset with me and think I was making a mistake, and actually he was right uh, pretty much every time. Um, and you know the pro when you have an intimate relationship with someone, you can take certain liberties. I mean, so you know. He would um, like one of the interesting things about my dad was that he would, if you were lucky um, and you were close enough to him, he would get. He didn't actually give advice. Almost, he he didn't like to give advice, Amir, to anybody. If you were lucky, he might give you advice once, and if you didn't listen to him, he would never give you advice a second time. Um, and but when you have an intimate relationship with him, your family member, so he would he would break that rule in a sense, and he would give me advice more than once about something he thought. Like I remember when I went into university, and he was concerned I was becoming overly intellectual in the sense of my ego was getting too attached to my my intellect and not and i was missing out on this on the spiritual understandings of life he was a hundred percent correct at the time that's exactly what was happening but i didn't see it at the time so he would you know several times point that out to me that and sometimes quite forcefully that look you're you're missing the boat here you're missing the point here be careful you know, it was a warning, a warning shot to be careful. So, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't do that with other people. So, um, and the reason is he understood the futility of um, repeating 
warnings to people because if they didn't listen to him the first time, they were very unlikely to listen to him the second or the third time. So he, he didn't waste his time with that. Um, he, he wouldn't, um, wouldn't dwell on it um, because he knew until their level of awareness or understanding changed, they wouldn't understand what he was saying anyway. So that's kind of a, a longer winded way of saying, no, that's that great. I, I love I, it. You know, uh, it, and probably you with your children are the same. I mean, you, it, you have that intimate relationship. So, uh, um, you know, you can be quite frank with, with your children sometimes in the ways that you might not be frank with other people. You know? Of course. And, and was he, yeah. was he, if someone didn't understand or, or, didn't see his worldview was he pretty forgiving or what were like where was he a for, forgive like was he a forgiving person or how how was his sentiment with with people that uh, disagreed with him or didn't see his worldview he was profoundly forgiving because he saw the innocence in the that person and he he saw himself in a way in that person too because he at one point um you know, he was very lost as well. So, and he, he emphasized over and over and over the importance of forgiveness. You know, the, this kind of the three, the kind of the Trinity were gratitude, hugely important, forgiveness, and understanding those three things so but gratitude and forgiveness um he put tremendous tremendous importance of in humility that's another one those three things humility gratitude forgiveness the kind of a a, a holy trinity in a sense of, of principles to to live your life by and he said if you have those three things you will go far in terms of your spiritual development. But um, uh, but he was tremendously, I mean, he forgave me a, a lot, <laughs> put it that way. I was not, to be absolutely frank, I was not always um, an easy child, maybe. I mean, I was tri- quite strong-willed, strong-minded in many ways. Um, and, um, I had strong opinions on things. Strong opinions is never a good thing, by the way. Being highly opinionated is not good. It's not a good thing. And I was quite opinionated for a period of time. And, you know, it was just my own sort of arrogance and ego. But, um, you know, he, it must have been terribly frustrating for him, actually. I can only imagine. Um, Sometimes I think he must have felt like he was with a, uh, a classroom of kindergarten kids, you know, because he's <laughs> trying to explain um, quantum theory or something. But so he, he, he had to be extremely humble himself in order to uh, deal with what he dealt with. I mean, he had, I mean, it must have been just so elementary to him, and yet it escaped everyone around him. But he was trying to, but he was trying to explain. But um, I can only imagine, actually, how how challenging and frustrating that would be. You, you understand, understand what I'm saying? In there? Absolutely, I lo- absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, something that's so obvious to him and yet it's not obvious to to the people he's talking to it's that takes a lot of humility not to get frustrated of course yeah um sebastian has a, a question are you okay with answering sebastian sure. go ahead all right dave uh, maybe you just uh, answered the question but i will um bring it up anyways um like we are some coaches therapists we are um, with uh, some close buys um and we want to 
have them understand the three principles because maybe then they would have a better life. How would your father react to to these change workers and they really wanted to help the world and make it a better place um, when they are kind of fr frustrated or when people disagree or when it's not really working that people understood what your father and we in some degree understand about life, about thought, about whatever. Um, how would he, what would uh, he, uh, be, he no, his advice be? Hmm. Would you frame that again, that question? Um, when, we, the... when we want to help people understand the true nature of life or how we function um, and people don't get it, or um, right. you, how would he uh, react or how uh, would he manage these situations? Or didn't he even uh, bring up the topic, but people came to him? so that people were interested in the first place. Because what I see is that sometimes I want to share all the stuff and people are not open or are not ready to hear, to listen. Well, I would say, you know, I spent most of my adult life as a teacher uh, in, in classrooms. And one of the things that I discovered was that when a young person uh, is not understanding something, um, there's no, there's no point in, and sometimes it has often, sometimes it has to do with their level of, of, of consciousness. They might be frustrated or agitated or, or, um, um, there's just a lot in their home life or whatever. Uh, they're disturbed in some way. Um, and to try to teach to them in that state of mind is really a waste of time. You have to, you have to change their, um, change their state of mind before you can have any hope of, of, of teaching them because someone who's in an agitated, frustrated, confused state of mind, that's what my dad was, you know, he would, he was really, um, he had really good, you know, when he, um, at 18, he joined the Navy, the British Navy. And um, uh, they, when you join the military, they give you an aptitude test, I guess. And then from, based on that aptitude test, they, they assign you to a particular area. Now, he got assigned to radar. And radar was a, a very new technology. This was just after the Second World War. It was a very new technology at the time. So I don't know what it was about him. But I know he had a really good radar because he could immediately, when he met someone, he could tell what their state of mind was. And he, if he felt that they were um, distracted or frustrated or in a negative state of mind or whatever, he would not waste his time uh, trying teaching them anything. He would just take them on a walk or you know, sit down and, uh, you know, have, have a cup of tea with them. But he knew he had to change. He had to kind of create that space around the conversation where they, they felt at, at ease and at peace before he had any chance of, um, quote, unquote, teaching them anything. So uh, a lot of it has to do with creating, my answer is a lot of it has to do with understanding where what what state of mind that person is in firstly and secondly creating a space where their level of awareness can improve but you have to first understand their state of mind does does that make any sense that makes perfect sense. I work in a primary school and that's exactly what I see that first you try to connect with the person or ask questions or just be curious about the person, other person and then maybe the, the the child or the other person is open to to listen or to connect. Yeah. If... You have to develop a rapport, I guess you might say, uh, with, with the person there. But, you know, um, so I think you under, yeah, being in a, a teaching in a classroom environment, you understand exactly what I'm saying. But my father was, 
in a sense, he was living in this big classroom. This is kind of an interesting way of looking at it. So the, the world around him was like this big classroom and people were coming into his classroom all the time. And they were in various states of, of, um, uh, of mind, in different levels of consciousness and dealing with all kinds of personal problems or professional problems or work-related, family-related problems. And the interesting thing is, he didn't care what the problem was. I mean, people say, well, that's, how could, how is that possible? Said you, you have to first understand the problem before you can help the person. But he, he instinctively knew that the problem was irrelevant. And, that, and the problem was irrelevant because the divine intelligence was, he, was, could heal any problem, no matter what it was. It was the same solution, the same answer, no matter what the problem was. And um, that was something that the, the psychologists had to, had to understand was that because that was a major departure from what psychologists normally were taught was that first you have to really understand the problem and the history of the problem and before you have any chance of resolving the problem or healing the problem. My dad was saying exactly the opposite. Has he, it's completely irrelevant, he was saying. Because whatever the problem was, the answer was the same. And the answer was divine understanding, divine uh, intelligence. So uh, it's a... It's a uh, it's a, a healing power that is, exceeds all others and it can heal literally any psychological problem. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much for answering, Dave, and I will give it to uh, okay. Amir. Okay. Yes, and we have one final, uh, final, I have a final question for you. First of all, thank you. This has been incredible. This is, uh, I couldn't have, ask for a, a better conversation. So thank you, Dave. Um, I want to I wanna ask you, you know, one thing that you said on a phone call with me privately is that you want to continue your father's legacy. It's really, really important. And I know you have some things in the pipeline. I wanted you to kind of explain to mm -hmm. us what you're planning on doing, what your, what your vision is, and what your, what your future is with, with this thing that your father has profoundly changed, you know, with, with what, what he's done. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, I, um, I can, my vision is that his teachings are becoming more and more popular, Amir, and they're, they're pretty much all over the world at this point. And I want to do whatever small part I can do to share his 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 gift his spiritual gift with with others and to maintain the purity of that of those teachings and so i am establishing a non-profit foundation um, that its principal aim will be aims will be to share his understanding and also to as much as possible maintain the purity of teachings and is there any any upcoming books? Is there anything that we may have not seen from him? Is there anything that you may, I mean, is there anything that, that might be, I don't know if I'm ruining a surprise, but is there anything that we, we should be looking forward to? Well, time will tell, but I think there will be some, some writings emerge as well. And I, I'm also, I'm also planning to, uh, re-release, do an anniversary, 50th anniversary edition of Second Chance, which is his first book um, with the original cover on it, 1983 cover. So that, that, that is sort of in the works and we'll see when that emerges, but there will be, there will be material coming out, yes. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, for everyone here that, that had to leave early, we will, we will, I'll get the recording up uh, thank you so much for everyone for your questions and for joining us and for all of it, just having uh, 
having this time is incredible. It's been a long time since I've done this and what a way to get back into it with, with Dave. Uh, any, any final thoughts, Dave, before we close this up? Well, no, I just wanted to say th th thanks, Amir, for, for hosting this and thank you everyone for joining, joining the conversation today. I really do enjoy meeting people, especially new, new people that that's, um, something I, I want to do more of. And if anybody wants to, has a question, wants to personally contact me, please feel free to do so. You can do so on through Facebook. Um, the messenger. And, um, uh, uh, messenger, yeah. So, but I, I really, you know, it means a, a great deal to me that, um, and I'm really humbled by the fact that people have taken an interest in my, my dad's teachings. And uh, uh, again, my, I see my role as, as trying, you know, as paying it forward. Um, I will never completely be able to thank my father enough for what he did for me personally. And uh, I feel the only, my, my small part in this is to try to pay it forward and, and um, share his, his teachings as widely as possible. Well, I think everyone would agree you're doing a wonderful job and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what you do and, and how, how you continue to keep his uh, legacy alive. And uh, again, thank you so much for everyone. And thank you, Dave, once again, for, for being on here and maybe we'll do a follow-up. I'm sure a lot of people have more questions to come. And if, if you guys would like that, uh, let me know once I post it on Facebook and all the other places and we'll go from, we'll take it from there. Again, one wonderful to have sure. you guys, and uh, thank you, and we'll see you guys all soon. Have a wonderful uh, day, you guys, and thank you, Dave. Thank you, Amir. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. We'll, we'll do it again. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.